Well, good evening. Dave, good take evening. it away. Okay. Good evening. My name is Dave Good. I'm the Constituent Services Administrator for Chesterfield. In a moment, I'm going to introduce our host for the evening, but before I do, I wanted to take just a minute to cover some housekeeping related to the format of our meeting tonight. Um, we do these meetings both in person uh, and also virtually. So just a couple of notes in terms of participation. If members of who are here in person have comments and questions if they would please step up to the same mic I'm at this evening uh, to pose their comments and questions that's very helpful in terms of the production uh, and everybody here as well as those at home hearing and seeing uh, who's participating and also um, those of you who are tuning in via Facebook live which is our virtual option um, please feel free to provide your comments and questions through the feed within Facebook live we have staff here tonight who are monitoring those questions, we'll pull them and get them to our panel this evening. Um, just an important note, this, this uh, meeting is also being streamed on the county's YouTube channel, as well as the county's Chesterfield County Television on Comcast Channel 98 and Verizon Channel 28. Um, just one more point I'd like to make. We do have sign-in sheets for anybody who is here in person. If you didn't sign up when you came in the door, please feel free to do so as you leave. Just gives us an opportunity to provide you additional information as we move through the budget process. But anyway, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to now turn over the mic to the Honorable Chris Winslow, who is the Clover Hill District uh, Supervisor and Chair of the Board of Supervisor, who Board of Supervisors, who will be hosting tonight's meeting. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome. This is the uh, second of um, five community meetings for budget town halls in the uh, 2023 budget cycle. And so I'm pleased to be your host tonight, and uh, we'll have hopefully some good discussion, good question, a good presentation. As Dave mentioned, in addition to those who have joined us in person, we also have a virtual audience. And so no matter how you are participating, I appreciate your time and thank you for joining us. With me tonight are Dr. Joe Casey, our county administrator, to my left. Um, and Mr. David Oakley, our budget manager. Now, just for a moment, uh, it is Mr. Oakley's birthday. And so I know for a fact that there is nowhere else on earth that he would rather be than at this budget town hall tonight. And so we thank him for coming out and filling in for uh, Mr. Harris. In a moment, Mr. Oakley's gonna run through a brief presentation on the budget and then Dr. Casey and I will assist in answering questions. Tonight's meeting is just one way to engage with Chesterfield on the county's proposed budget. We'll have a public hearing this spring prior to adopting a balanced budget. And at any time, you may visit a special website we devote to the process at blueprint.chesterfield.gov. Um, just from my perspective, the overall themes of this budget is um, balancing our goals as a county along with uh, historic tax relief and trying to be responsive to the financial condition that our citizens are facing right now. The rising impact of home and vehicle values um, is certainly taking an impact and um, we are trying to lessen that impact as we remain focused on the outstanding programs and services Chesterfield citizens have come to expect for their hard earned tax dollars. So we are as committed to our long term goals as ever and tonight prior to taking questions you're going to hear about our historic investment in schools, what we're doing to recruit and retain the best employees to serve citizens a $540 million bond referendum package we're planning for the fall, uh, and the broadest tax relief package Chesterfield has ever offered. Before I turn the mic over to Mr. Oakley, I want to recognize Ms. Dorothy Heffron, the Clover Hill District representative for the Chesterfield County School Board. Schools are, of course, of huge importance in terms of how we invest in the community. Ms. Heffron, we appreciate you joining us this evening. Again, I thank everyone for joining us in this discussion and encourage you to remain as engaged as Chesterfield continues to navigate the annual budget process. Thank you. Mr. Oakley. Thank you, Mr. Winslow. We are here tonight, like Mr. Winslow mentioned, to have a conversation with the citizens of Clover Hill District in Chesterfield County. The presentation we'll be going over is highlights from the materials that have been discussed with the Board of Supervisors and citizens going all the way back to December. Following the presentation, we'll have a Q&A, and you're always welcome to reach out via the website or emailing blueprint at chesterfield.gov. The FY23 budget 
priorities that you see here in no specific order um, are the emphasis for the four areas we will be going over this evening. Thank you. First and foremost, uh, broad tax relief is something that we have built into this plan. We'll be explaining this over the next few slides and I won't go into all the details here, um, but what you see is the largest investment in tax relief in county history with an emphasis on real estate, vehicles, and seniors in our community. What we're showing in this chart is, um, is the real estate tax rates and you can see the different colors and what they represent, uh, green being reduction years and the one yellow being an increase. And then on the far right, you can see the 0.92, uh, which is proposed in this budget. As you've heard in the media and other local outlets, home assessments are on the rise. And um, from what you see on the slide, the tax rate is being proposed at the lowest level rate in recent history to help de defray some of that tax burden to the citizens in Chesterfield County. This represents approximately 15 million countywide or about 120 per household. Personal property tax release, relief. As you've also likely heard in, in the news, supply chain issues um, with new vehicles have driven up the cost of all vehicle assessments. This pack package is proposed in the budget to reflect an enhanced tax relief plan valued at an additional 15 million countywide. While citizens may pay rent and not necessarily receive the benefits of the real estate tax, the majority of our citizens here in Chesterfield County will experience some relief with the personal property tax. This chart you see in front of you here um, in previous budget cycles has been shown as a cross-section of a dollar bill. We've mixed it up a little bit this year with this graphic, um, but the point still stands. You can see that out of 75 cents of every tax dollar being put towards education, public safety, and capital infrastructure. Focusing in on general fund growth, here we have a depiction of every new dollar being invested in the county. And you can see again, education and infrastructure being two large components here. The major piece of this plan, investment in workforce, just for one example, Chesterfield County has been lagging by starting pay for firefighters by 17.5%, um, making it increasingly difficult to find and retain talent. These funds are set to address those types of issues. Expanding further on employee compensation, I'll spare you from reading the details uh, as you see them on the slide here. Uh, again, big topic in the news these days. Um, and just like our firefighter example, there are many key support areas here in the county that need to be addressed. Custodians, trade positions, and CDL positions, just to name a few. Five-year plan enhancements. With the minimal amount left, to uh, provide service enhancements in the 2023 budget, um, our Im impact here directly affects our citizens. So included in this plan is funding for minimum staffing over in our fire department, library funding for the conversion of part-time to full-time positions, which carries out through the remainder of the five-year plan, parks maintenance crews to ensure well-maintained and clean parks, and a new tax, uh, taxpayer portal so citizens can do business with the county from the comfort of their homes. Now, like every year, there are many unfunded requests. You can see some amounts here that are outlining what we are experiencing here in 2023. Uh, these requests are outlined in our budget document, so you can refer to that, which is on our website. Um, but tax relief and direct services to our citizens have taken priority through this 2023 budget. Another point to note is we are budgeting in uncertain times. Um, again, focusing back to what we're hearing in the public sphere, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world at the moment. This budget has been built, been built with flexibility, addressing core needs and ensuring that we do not have to come back to reevaluate rates or funding streams mid-cycle. Just a quick look at government spending per capita, something we like to reevaluate with each budget cycle. Uh, you can see here that this chart has a high watermark of 2009, 
adjusting for inflation, per capita cost operating at levels comparable to actually back to 1992. Now here on this chart, you see a similar story um, going back to 2009. Here you can see the local investment in our school division on a per pupil basis, keeping pace. In the proposed plan to the, to the school division, it's reported as an increase of 18 million from the prior year. In reality, the county's support for the school division is an ongoing endeavor and cannot be summed up in the confines of a single proposed budget. Just for one example, back in December, the Board of Supervisors fully funded the school supplement retirement program, which freed up 10 million in operating. This funding allowed the school or the county to sell debt and expedite the construction of two well-needed middle schools prior to any bond referendum. And getting on to the bond referendum, the referendum included in this plan, which you may have heard discussed in our last two cycles, um, was postponed and then postponed because of a pandemic. Uh, this represents 540 million, 375 of that will be going towards schools with the remainder focused in on parks, libraries, and public safety, all without an increase in real property taxes. The referendum is planned for the ballot in November. So taking a look at the next slide, we can see the timeline of how we plan to, to slot these projects. As we go through, you can see that it's compressed into a, a five-year window. And then, of course, utilities. Finally, we, are, we have proposed residential utility rates, which you can see are very competitive compared to our peers in the region. I'm very proud of that. And then looking to the road ahead. As Mr. Winslow mentioned, this is the second budget meeting for the public, and we have three more planned for the 16th, the 21st, and the 22nd. And then we'd like to invite everybody listening and anybody they, they talk to you to come out for our bu budget public hearing on March 23rd. The budget is set to be adopted on April 6th. So with that, I will turn it back to Mr. Winslow and we would love to hear any questions that you all have or questions that are coming in via Facebook. Great, thank you Mr. Oakley. And um, uh, there's a lot in each of those slides and so uh, we may be recurring back to them uh, as the evening progresses, but um, if we have folks who'd like to come speak who are in the audience, now is your time to shine. Come on up, and uh, if you have any questions, we can go through those uh, now. I don't have any questions so far online, and so um, we have a little bit of a gap. Good evening. Good evening My sir. name is Fred DeMay. live in the Metallica District. Um, I attended the meeting with uh, Jim Holland uh, last week. Um, this is the first time I'd seen the budget, a little bit of studying over the weekend. And there's a couple of questions that I have on this. One of the, um, one of the claims here is that we're going to cut the vehicle registration tax from 40 to $20. That's an amazing 50% reduction. But there's, there's an issue here about the 1.5 cent cut or it's, it's, it's roughly equivalent to a 1.5 cent cut in the real estate tax rate. This is a fixed fee, but the real estate tax rate, when multiplied by the assessment, gives you a variable number. How, how does this equate out, or what's the math behind the one and a half cent uh, uh, claim here on the uh, tax rate? Sure, so that, that uh, one and a half cents we recalculate that every year, so it's changed in my time in the budget office. But this year, that 15 million represents what 1.5 cents on the real estate tax would have been. So it's specific to this fiscal cycle. Okay, this I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, the car registration fee, the, the $40 fee that's being dropped to 20. Yes, that, okay. so that eight and a half million? And it, yeah, the eight million, yes, yes, yes. Is, is, the 15 was the, um, was the uh, change in the uh, my rate. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. Continue. No, no, how do you equate that to, to what, I'm, what I'm asking is that if you have a fixed, a fixed fee of $40, you reduce it to 20, that's yes. a $20 difference. 
but when you apply this real estate tax situation, you're applying that rate to a variable number because the assessments for everybody vary. So the question is, it says it's equivalent to a 1.5 cent cut in the real estate rate, but there's no assessment to apply to that, so to speak. So, Mr. DeMay, you're right. What we're doing is we're just trying to do simple math, perhaps too simple, of just equating the $8 million savings of the vehicle registration fee. We are no longer going to be collecting an $8 million revenue source uh, in a balanced budget. And the real estate rate, uh, if, if that was solely a real estate rate reduction, it's equal to a penny and a half of the rate. So it's, it's an apple and an orange, yeah. but it's okay. fruit as far as the citizen and what they have to pay. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And I, I, and I gotta say, you know, a 50% tax reduction, phenomenal, phenomenal, ladies, phenomenal. Okay, the other, um, the other issue does apply to what you were discussing, Mr. Oakley. Um, it looks like you're in a position to increase the the um the payback or the uh the the vehicle threshold from 46 percent relief to 55 percent relief that's going back all the way to 2017. is that that correct the rate that it was in 2017. approximately 2017 2018. okay yeah. okay by the way that's also phenomenal because when we see the increases in the uh in the assessments on vehicles that number actually picks up the vast majority of that tab. I, uh, y'all have done a good job of, of, of really scouring this budget and making some, uh, some calls here that are really gonna make a difference to the people at Chesterfield. Um, and, and Mr. DeMay, I don't mind interrupting, but I think you know, with the math that you're doing, it's very helpful for others to understand too, is what uh, David was referring to in the 46% relief, that was the 2021 calendar year. We didn't even go through the exercise of what that lower percent would be under the fixed state revenue source that we get for car tax relief. That number could have gone to 40 percent, 39 percent. So it, it's not just the difference between 46 and 55. Many localities are continuing to have less and less of the yes. state relief go further. So it, it's really the differential from some number that may be in the upper 30s now all the way to 55 percent. And we, we may need to do that math at some point in time. It, that might be beneficial because what that does is that actually raises the uh, the percentage that you're taking off. And like I mentioned to you earlier, you know that percentage I calculated on mine about 20% a little bit, and we're looking about 18. So whoever ran that number ran a very very tight number to to what the actual numbers w w will very likely look like. Um, the last question that I that I had for you on this too is that um, we had this 106 million dollar surplus. But um, I had a discussion with Matt Harris, and apparently a, a chunk of that was due to the COVID relief and this kind of thing. So this won't be a reoccurring, I mean, $106 million is a pretty big, pretty big surplus, but that money came in unbeknownst. I mean, you guys didn't know what that was going to be. And now, now that you see it, that won't be reoccurring though next year. So we're, we're going to see surpluses that are probably substantially less coming up. I, I think that's right. Uh, Mr. DeMay, and uh, of course, the other thing to keep in mind is that even though some of the checks arrived from the federal government on these, the rules of how they could be spent have been in a constant state of flux in some cases, particularly with ARPA monies. I think the guidance is changing again. And so um, this is something we're following very closely. But yes, I, I do not anticipate um, that kind of a, a windfall Good. In, in future budgets. Okay. Yeah, the two, the two last issues are, you know, no, number one, you, you've done quite a job of, of moving through the budget, finding these issues, and, um, you know, looking at the, at the places where you can make the most bang for the buck, and I think that's a, that's a big hit. Um, it certainly is the most aggressive tax, uh, tax relief that I've seen in Chesterfield in my 26 years. Um, the other thing, and I mentioned this to Mr. Casey, Dr. Casey, Dr. Casey um, that uh, you guys are very proactive on this. You know, lesser governments would have let this fall out on the floor substantially before they did anything. And, and being proactive on this is going to keep this at bay at a time when people are really suffering. When you see $4.30 gas, you go to stores, you see massive, massive increases in your grocery bills and stuff. Um, people, are, people are hurting and it, it, it really demonstrates good government when you're out there and you're preempting these problems. So I just wanna say that uh, this is, uh, this is a great step forward, gentlemen, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you uh, next week on the 23rd. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.
Uh, it looks like we have a question from the online. Why is our per pupil expenditure $9,987, according to VDOE report, so much lower than the Richmond spending and the state average? Um, I guess one of the, and I'll pass that on here shortly, but one of the questions I would have about that number is, does that include debt service? Because, of course, in Chesterfield, for whatever reason, as we talk about per pupil expenditures for our students in, in Chesterfield schools, we don't include debt service, and I, I, I have never really understood that. But that would add about $1,000 per pupil, um, and so I'm, I'm not sure how we stack up on that. Yeah, I, one is... Um I'm sure that that figure from the Virginia Department of Education is right, the 9,987, which I think is came, came out online. And the VDOE, you know, to their credit, they try and do is apples to apples comparison amongst the 130 plus school systems in, in the state of Virginia. And, and Chesterfield County Schools fill out all the proper forms and, and comply with all the way the, the numerators and denominators are calculated. We try and work with our school partners as much as possible, too, to understand not just that number, but there's lots of other variables that go into the number that VDOE may not have as part of this operational formula. Uh, capital investment is one of them. The capital improvement program for which the schools devote a lot of time and attention, major maintenance expenses and so forth are, are funneled through there. Um, you know, I think it's just one of those numbers that we're going to probably have to disclose two or three ways uh, for the foreseeable future, especially as we enter a bond referendum. Um, the other thing, too, is I think, just from my experience, that the collaborative relationships between the county and the schools for things that we do together, that we don't play accountant necessarily in charging the schools for and grossing up two sides of a budget to make it look like we're bigger than we otherwise are, uh, there's things that we do. And I think that was even one slide. There were a few things that were, quote, unquote, no asks of the schools that were part of our school uh, funding with them. So I, I think it's just a learning a process we all need to go through in, in educating ourselves and the school side and our citizens so that we can present uh, the VDOE number and present uh, other numbers. The challenge is as we present other numbers, they're hard to compare against other jurisdictions because I don't know the details between their uh, numerators and denominators. It's always been one of those perplexing things to me, Joe, that we, um, that we don't have uh, that number included because, I mean, certainly we're, we're building schools, and, and that's what we're talking about here with these debt service components. We're building schools for students, and certainly um, I think – you know, I think that counts <laughs> when you do the math problem. So, again, I'm not really certain why that's not included with, with the VDOD. It doesn't make any sense to me. Hello. Miss D, how are you? I'm all right, thanks. Um, I'm going to keep it brief, but I'm just here to thank you for your collaborative nature with the Chesterfield County Schools. I appreciate kind of um, the change in tide and now allowing them to be more open in a needs-based budget. Um, I don't think that's always been as transparent in the past. So I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, and in doing that, um, I think that there's still about a $8 gap or $8 million, $8 would be amazing, $8 million <laughs> gap in what their, their ask is and what um, your number is um, allowing in your budget. Um, it is a needs-based budget. Um, I appreciate that employees and quality staff, um, not just educators, but the support staff are now in that phase two are also being recognized and included. Um, we're not asking for really even a lot of things. This is bare bones, not absorbent paper towels, not the highest level of, um, you know, innovative things at this point. I think it's just really, as we've seen through the pandemic, keeping the doors open, keeping bodies in the classroom, having substitutes show up when we cannot, because that is not what's happening now. Um, so I just hope that you will keep that in mind. I don't know. I know that there are other jurisdictions. I've looked at many different presentations and slides. Henrico seems to be the one that we compare ourselves against the most. Um, I left there in 2008. The first time I sat in here was in 2008, wondering if I would have a job. And I wonder if I didn't and I had returned to them in 2009 or 2010, what my fin finances would look like. My f and, and I see colleagues um, from that time that have continued with them, and their quality of life is, is different. 
So I want you to keep that in mind um, for those of us that have been here since, I know there was a slide in one presentation from um, fiscal year 2010 to 22. Um, pay was frozen for two of those years. Um, and 11, fiscal year 11, two to 3% um, reduction in pay. Nine of those years, there was no step increase. SRP was neglected. So we appreciate you giving that money back and refunding it, but it wasn't um, attended to. And that was no fault of the, the educators at that time or that are continuing with you to hopefully have that benefit. So thank you for putting it back um, so that we can, you know, have that benefit that we were promised when we intended to be employed with this, this uh, county. That's it. I don't really have a question, so I don't know if I need to I stand can. or if you have a response, but that was it. Sure. Well, one, thank you for the comments. Two is, uh, you know, the needs-based budget in fairness to schools and their disclosures, it's actually lent us also in the back of our budget document is all the needs-based budgets of all of our departments. Before, you know, as a county administrator proposed, we worked out the needs-based exercises just in discussions and, and processes of what we could balance to. But uh, I think David referred to that in his presentation. So, uh, you know, police, fire, sheriff, you know, 30 departments and actually, in essence, present needs-based budgets every year. So we are trying to be more transparent to it all. We're also trying to balance that against the abilities and burdens of the taxpayer uh, and businesses. So it, it, there's an exercise to it. Uh, I do applaud the schools, though. The, 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 the step system they instituted last year uh, decompresses uh, the steps so that uh, my understanding is no, no two years that are sharing the same step anymore. Some of the localities you referenced still have that. Uh, issue. They may have raised a, a starting salary, but they, they don't, don't progress as fast as, as we do. We're continuing to work with the schools to put monies away each year in surplus. So sometimes things that may be needs during a budget process, we actually, in the summertime, into the school's credit, they save their nickels and dimes as well as we do, and we try and reinvest all of that back in to get some things done. Some of those may be more one-time, but some, as you saw in the SRP investment, a one-time investment can yield annual savings that, again, can be part of an operating base budget. So that, that's all working to, to our collective advantage. It's certainly above my pay grade to know where you, know, you can find the funds, and I appreciate you creating the reductions. Most of us are also um, you know, residents. We pay the taxes as well, so we appreciate that um, care. Um, and I don't know, we are very heav heavily residential county. Um, and I know that we are trying to diversify in some ways and there's some resistance and um, I don't know what the answer is, but people are gonna move here and wanna remain here with the quality of their schools, um, the educators that are there and um, you know, continuing forward, we just wanna make sure that that help, you know, that the quality of our schools are maintained and, and, and you keep the people that you currently have. Thank you. I'm just going to append on on that because of it. there's there certainly um, we we want to keep the quality of schools too. In fact, we want to enhance it. And um, when we take a look at uh, some of the things that have been uh, in our radar over the last couple of years, I mean, one of the things that kind of was very quiet was a 58 million dollar major maintenance bond package in the fall of, of 2020. And um, that work was critical at a lot of schools in replacing HVAC equipment. Uh, we have tried to be smart. In fact, I got off the phone with a reporter from the New York Times uh, last week who's doing a story on how Chesterfield has used uh, ARPA funds. And this reporter is very interested in the fact that uh, some of these funds are going to, to build two new middle schools in Chesterfield County. And many of the localities across America use those dollars in some sort of an operational one-time context, but we recognize the value of one-time monies and really have employed them, I think, in a smart way to support the school system. And I think many of the slides uh, that um, Mr. Oakley presented, and then I think of uh, the most recent event um, with uh, three, I think four million dollars going toward our school bus driver pay, which has apparently eliminated double backs in the county, which is great news. I see a gradual improvement over time in our school system. And I think we, um, 
you know, we've had some tough conversations with our counterparts on the school board over the years, but I do think we have had improvement, gradual improvement. And at some point here, we're going to be able to say, you know, we've built back from the Great Recession. And I think that day is coming. And um, um, I've had a, a lot of people who are, you know, can, can sometimes be very critical of government, say, you know, you all took these monies and you're very responsible with them. Uh, as the SRP uh, <laughs> monies, I mean, I, as, I, as I like to joke, I still have PTSD from that whole discussion uh, that, that took a lot of time and energy. But the fact that we freed up $10 million annually for operational items for the school system is deeply meaningful, I know, as, as that work continues. Um, and then it sort of shapes up where we have to go this fall with the bond referendum. And that is extremely important to the next 10, 20 years of our school division. And Ms. D, you talk about you know, wanting to, to maintain the quality and I want to make it better. And I think that that is, um, that is what we uh, are trying to do. We have no other online um, comments at this moment. Um, are there other questions from the audience? Come on up. You're the next contestant. Good evening. Hey, sir. My, name, my name is Justin Walker. I mm -hmm. uh, appreciate you all being here tonight. A um, little bit about my background. Um, I am a member of the Chesterfield County Public Schools Environmental Stewardship uh, Advisory Committee. Um, I became part of that committee because I have about a 20-year um, history in the energy conservation space. Uh, but I don't, I don't want you to think about hugging trees when I say that. Uh, I work specifically with school districts and municipalities to help them be better stewards of their dollars, which directly impacts their environmental uh, footprint. Um, but anytime we can save energy, we're saving carbon, we're all saving dollars. Um, I would like to read you first a, a quick statement that our committee has crafted um, based on what we are seeing from our perspective uh, about the upcoming budget. So I'll read that real quick and then I'll amend it with a couple of my own thoughts. Um, as a citizen of Chesterfield County and as a member of the Chesterfield County Public Schools Environmental Stewardship Advisory Committee, um, I'm here tonight to encourage the Board of Supervisors to approve the CCPS operating budget as requested so that our schools can effectively serve our growing population of students. It's our committee's opinion that the CCPS faculty, uh, facility staff is operating our facilities as optim optimally as possible with the current equipment and resources that they have and being good stewards of county funds. CCPS has done more with less for many years. We think it's time to give our staff the tools they need to keep our community competitive when it comes to attracting residents and businesses. For better or worse, well-paying companies and highly educated employees that our county seeks to entice will give strong deference to the quality of public education accessible to their children. Just like any business, we have, a, we have to be competitive to attract the best talent that we can to our community. From my perspective, um, we, we've heard a lot of talk about how government should be run more like a business. As a matter of fact, some of our more recent, very well-known politicians who were quite popular in our county were widely lauded for their business acumen. Strictly speaking from a business standpoint, Chesterfield County has a product. Setting aside any discussion about a moral obligation or do it for the children or these teachers are pouring their hearts out, just strictly talking about business. Our county has a product that is improving. You're correct, Mr. Winslow, when you say we are making improvements. My concern is that we are not improving as fast as our surrounding counties, our competitors. That our competitors are essentially producing a better product faster than we are because they are investing more. Not simply that they are investing more. Our county is investing in the schools and our schools are doing a very good job with what they have, in my opinion, from a facilities operation standpoint. I'll, I'll grant fully, I know very little about teacher pay and competitiveness and uh, on that side and, and those aspects. But from what I've seen from Josh Davis, who I, I can't speak enough about, 
Um, they are doing so much more than most of the schools that I see in my 20 year career. They are finding ways to operate these schools better with less money, but they have a long, a long road to go. They can do even more if we give them the resources. So my request is simply that we use surplus to fund the entire budget as requested for the operating budget for Chesterfield County as, as the, board, the school board has uh, proposed. So uh, if you have any comments, I'm happy to, to respond, but thank you very much for your time tonight. I appreciate you all being here on a Monday night to, to listen to us speak. Thank you, sir. I will just echo that uh, Josh Davis, for those that don't know that are listening or in the audience, the uh, chief operating officer for the school system. Uh, again, um, we work hand in glove with him and I respect his opinion quite a bit. He, he was actually a, an instrumental person in the very beginnings of the pandemic in order to figure out HVAC systems and maintenance dollars and how to use and leverage the federal dollars uh, to one time catch up. And um, the major maintenance program uh, investments that are being made, they're catching up uh, and hopefully then being maintained at about a 2.5%, I think, of asset value is once we get that foundational element as part of the budget, then that momentum then can also then be leveraged and utilized for a lot of the other things that are for the school's needs. So uh, again, thank you for recognizing Mr. Davis because he is a true partner and we recognize him as well. He's also, Joe, been, been interested, uh, interested and, and uh, wonderfully helpful with the um, School Safety Task Force uh, Force's recommendations from 2018. Um, uh, we have largely made the improvements that were recommended for um, our physical components of the school uh, the school buildings uh, in terms of having atriums in, in buildings and cameras and making certain that our surrounding space is secure. And so I'd, I, I want to call, uh, call him out on that too because he deserves some kudos. Uh, for that, and that's something that's happened over the last two years that I don't think few, may, many people know about. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on the, the Josh Davis <laughs> fan club as well. All right, let's see. The major maintenance was to replace systems that were not budgeted to be maintenance. Will that be managed more effectively in the future? The major maintenance was to replace systems that were not budgeted to be maintenance. So I, I know that this, the schools um, and the county have had um, discussions over the years about getting to that 2.5% budgeted rate for major maintenance for both sides. And I believe the county is there. The school division, I think, has a little bit of ways to go, but I know that that is our goal, and I think that has improved. And I think we're not, we're not there at two and a half, but we're, we are inching closer every year to getting to a place where the school system's budget includes that two and a half percent that is estimated that will be needed in their division to make certain that, that maintenance is, is taken care of. So I think that's the point of that question is that the $58 million was catch up money uh, and, and that is true. Uh, we had that uh, ass assessment report for all of our facilities in the school division. We looked at that a few years ago. And so that is true. Uh, that $58 million certainly helped us with that. Uh, Mr. Oakley. Yeah, that, um, that has been an effort that's been several years in the making and the county has finally achieved that. We actually spoke to that in a slide on our capital improvement program work session with the Board of Supervisors, if anybody would like to go back and, and reference that. But those efforts, um, while, while we were trying to achieve that within the budget cycles, the, the board wanted to achieve it faster. So that is uh, why those one-time funds were identified and then as we go further into future budget cycles, we will be keeping that as a priority to maintain the policy level. And just as a reference to the to business practices, the, the two and a half percent, it really equates to a, a an accounting standard of, of a 40 year useful life of a building, depreciated life of a building. So two and a half percent is really, you're always over the course of the 40 years, you've reinvested 100% in essence, to try and maintain a facility to the degree that is if it was new. And that's the, that's the roof, that's the HVAC systems, electrical and plumbing, maybe parking lot maintenance and some grounds maintenance uh, of a capital nature. So 
that is a business practice I've seen and I borrowed, quite frankly, from my private sector career. Great. Any other comments from the audience or questions? We've got nothing else online right now. Come on down. Welcome. Hi, my name is Laura Abbott, and um, my daughter goes to Tomahawk, and currently Tomahawk has the mega trailer, but then they also have five in the back, and I was wondering what the county has in mind to get rid of the trailers and to move students into quality buildings that I believe would attract more people to our county and improve our school conditions. I don't believe that the trailers are safe for kids. I believe there's a threat from, unfortunately, school shootings and other things. If you're in a trailer, they're not very sturdy. They're not, it's not like they have thick walls. They're, and so I don't really like the fact that my child is going in and out of a building. Um, she's zoned to go to Cosby. They have 13 trailers. They're zoned to get another one of the mega trailers next year. I'm not sure how many more of the trailers they're gonna be keeping. I know we don't like to call them trailers. We'd prefer you know, educational cottages. It makes it a little more charming, but all in all, it's a trailer and we're sticking our kids in them. Well, I think, and I appreciate that question. What, what we have tried to do is position uh, this Upper Magnolia zoning case, which is uh, forthcoming to include a new middle school site that will be a reliever school for falling uh, for, excuse me, Tomahawk Creek, not Falling Creek. Falling Creek is uh, out in Mr. Holland's district, but they're both being built simultaneously. So, uh, but this uh, this middle school will, um, if if the lines are drawn correctly, uh, will will provide a lot of uh, relief for our area. And yes, Tomahawk Creek covers a lot of ground in the county right now. And so that, uh, that middle school is needed, and we anticipate that zoning case uh, to be before us in May right now based on the current schedule. Um, so hopefully we will have uh, some closure to that topic, at least from a zoning perspective. Now, the county currently owns that land, so all of the items that you would ordinarily expect to be performed on a new school, a middle school, high school, elementary school, such as environmental wetlands and uh, what we do to prepare a site. We are doing all of that in advance so that we are ready to go, that we are locked and loaded and ready to start uh, construction. Um, so it, it will take some time. I would note that the number of trailers system-wide has been going down as the new schools that we have been, uh, been built um, uh, are going up, and I think we just uh, opened, uh, had the ribbon cutting for Ettrick uh, recently, and so we're trying to add capacity where we can, um, eliminate the trailers uh, where we can, um, and and this this one has been on my radar for for four years, so <laughs> we're trying to get it done as soon as possible, uh, with the understanding that you know there is a public. Um, uh, comment in and input component with any zoning case and any zoning matter and so I think we're we're working through those items and um, I mean that's the long-term solution is to put up another school um, short-term solutions um, you know I, th I think we're going to have to try to be creative <laughs> until we get that school um, school built so we're talking about a long term, you're talking about the long term, but we're talking about one middle school because we're only replacing one. We're just rebuilding Fallen Creek. But I mean, everywhere I look, there's growth. There, there, will, be I mean, there will be capacity added to Fallen Creek when that is rebuilt, um, a capacity that's really sorely needed for that area. So what about yes. the high schools? There is a high school slated for that same zoning case. It will probably not be... Um, near the middle and the elementary. Uh, so we're looking, I think there's been some discussions about where to place the high school. Uh, that's out in the Matoga district. Uh, but there will be a, another high school spot out there as well to provide relief to Cosby. Uh, we do have some, as, as I've spoken to Ms. Heffron, we've had some capacity um, 
at uh, Bird, we have some capacity at Monacan, and there's some things that we may be able to do from a line shifting perspective to provide a little more immediate relief to those populations. Um, but, but again, you know, we, we need to get on these buildings, and that's why you see the commitments from us on ARPA monies, those one-time monies, to try to get those built as soon as possible. Um, but we do have to get the, um, the, the case through in that case. Well, I do appreciate that, and thank you. Um, I really encourage you to support the budget. I would have preferred the budget to be supported without the $8 million deduction. As a citizen, I want to know that Chesterfield is going to have quality schools that are fully funded and our students uh, per pupil expenditure not be at the you know baseline. I understand that there is a discrepancy, but I don't think it's that big of a discrepancy. So if we want our county to be a quality county, then we need to put forth the investment. So thank you. We certainly appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm told that Falling Creek is going to add 700 seats in that uh, that area. So that's a that's an important number. And I'll also uh, add to it, if it wasn't clear in the budget, and I realize the budget's a big document, we're working with the schools actually for about 25,000 square feet at CTC Hall that is right now part of, you know, half of their school headquarters to work on a consolidated school headquarters will bring a lot more efficiencies and economies of scale. But uh, once that space is freed up at CTC Hall, uh, then hundreds more can be served at that school, not necessarily one-to-one -one for the Cosby ratio that was referenced, but again, anytime a student is at CTC Hall, they're taking up less space at any of our high schools. So uh, again, I defer and default to the schools to go through the programmatic needs, that's their responsibilities, but we are a partner in helping fund the transitions for a new school headquarters. That's an important, that's an important point. Uh, uh, and that, that was not a, an ask from the school division. I think it's, it's you know, safe to point that out. And um, that's something that, that we're interested in anyway in terms of expanding tech op, uh, opportunities in the county. Um, so anyway, appreciate you mentioning that. That's good. Other comments? I'm not seeing anything else online. Sir, you've been very patient. You got anything? You have a burning question? <laughs> no? Yes, sir. Come on back up. You can have another swing at me. <laughs> I actually just wanted to follow on to the brief discussion we had about the trailers. Um, sure. Before I do that, real quick, I want to thank you, Mr. Oakley. I believe we met on Friday virtually in a Teams meeting. They, they were kind enough to let me join. Yes, we did. The, it was the, nice the, meeting you. the Citizen Budget Advisory Committee met uh, on, on Friday, and they, they let me listen in. Uh, the, very well versed in the environmental and, and uh, um, operational side, not too familiar with the budgeting side, so just trying to expand my own knowledge a little bit. Well, um, if you don't mind before, and I meant sure. to say it while you're up here, um, I encourage you to look at the environmental stewardship website of the mm -hmm. county. Okay. We try and go through all the topical areas of, of again, trying to be a good steward. Right. There's a business to being a good steward, as right. you referenced, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we're gonna work further with the schools to good. also have some of their information embedded as a one-stop shopping, if you will, as far as everything that involves uh, stewardship Very of good. the environment. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd actually like to uh, get connected with some of those uh, community members and, and maybe there may be some crossover there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just real quick on the, uh, on the trailers, one of the things that I learned, I joined the committee uh, about the middle of last year. Um, they had been around for not, not terribly long, I think just one year prior to that, maybe two. Um, and one of their first initiatives was to um, recommend to the board that we try to remove the trailers. I think that was one of the, probably their biggest thing that they talked about the first um, year or two that they were in, in business. And uh, the, that was, at some point, there was a, there were survey data to help them back up that sentiment. Um, an interesting part about that data, though, was that there were some schools that were reporting that they prefer the trailers simply because the facility that they would otherwise be in is just that bad. Um, I, I love that I live in a part of the county that has schools where we have the opposite problem, right? Um, but I think it's really, really important for us when we think about attracting people to our county, that we think about that aspect of instead of let's just get rid of all the trailers, let's make sure that we're taking them out of the trailer and putting them into a school that, that people want to to come and join. So again, thank you. Just a quick follow-up. Thank you all very much. I'll, I'll say for purposes of full disclosure, I had third, fourth, and fifth grade in a, in a trailer. 
Um, and uh, certainly from a school safety task force standpoint, we do think that um, keeping everybody in the same building is a safer um, statement and something that we need to work toward countywide to the extent possible. Well, um, I see, see no other questions online. Um, certainly um, lots of other topics in the budget, but um, yes, Mr. DeMay. Will you entertain me for another round? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. We're, we're expensive up here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I see it's 720 on, a, anyway, on an 8 o'clock due date. Um, yeah, now that we're, we're bringing up some issues on the schools, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, after examining many studies and surveys on teacher pay, um, it's kind of unfortunate to note that the vast majority of those studies are purposely built by special interest groups like the National Education Association, the American Federation of Teachers, think tanks uh, with an agenda and others. And a lot of these studies refer to how the states stack up, the state teacher pay stacks up to uh, um, the national average. But when you take a hard look at what the national average is, it's highly skewed by five or so top states. And what that does is that really distorts the true picture in states like Virginia. Um, a much better metric is the median teacher pay, okay, by state, which tends to, to marginalize these states that are way out at the end of the curve with, with significantly higher pay. And after reading through several, several studies, many studies, what I had settled on here is two studies. One is from ADP, which is a massive company that does HR services, payrolls. Um, they have access to hundreds of school districts, you know, you know, tens of thousands of companies. And they put out a, a teacher salary situation. And now this is slightly dated. We're going back to uh, maybe 2021, okay? But in the, in the ADP study, we see that Virginia is rated, this is for starting salaries too. We also see a lot of information that's being distorted based on max, you know, you know the high end of teacher salaries versus starting salaries versus the different kind of teachers. I mean, we have a, have a problem in that right now we're, we're seeing, um, a real need for math teachers, a real need for science teachers, um, and a lot of these people may be soaked up in industry because of the general shortage of, uh, of qualified labor all over the place. Um, but in this, in this ADP study, we see that, um, that Virginia, out of the 50 states, and I want to go by states versus national average, because national average is, is, is skewing this, and it's, it's quite frankly, it's, it's, it's not a legitimate number to to use as a metric because of this, this, this huge skewing by just a few states. But what we do in the ADP study is I see that Virginia's ranked 15th out of 50 states. In addition to that, I looked at a, at a big study here done by um, Indeed, which is a big, big online hiring operation, I mean, tens of millions of jobs. And they've gone back and they've actually gone to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and done their numbers. And the reason I picked these two is because I, I, I really don't see that they have any agenda. They're just big operations with a lot of data points and a lot of numbers. And in the Indeed study, this is going back a year or two also, Virginia's ranked number 12. So when we hear people, and I've, I've heard this from a few people, that you know Virginia teachers are ranked down in the bottom three or four states and everything, when you when you actually look at the criteria used in these studies and the people who did these studies, and, and, and what I mean by that is that, quite simply, there's a lot of people with a political interest in teacher salaries. And I'll, I'll leave it at that for this discussion here. But in no way are our teachers at the bottom of the barrel. In fact, in all these studies, all the credible studies I saw, every one of them shows that Virginia state salaries, now obviously that's going to vary. We're going to get high salaries in Northern Virginia. I think the highest was, uh, was 6,000 over some of the lowest. We're looking at certain counties, maybe Southwestern Virginia, where salaries are, are, are very, very low. But in no case are they below, are they in the bottom half of the states. They're, all of them are in, the tw are in 25 or above. And in many cases, these salaries are in the top third. 
So I think, I think that once you look at some fair studies, and what I mean by fair studies is, is not politically biased, that, that we see that, yes, there's room for improvement, and as I mentioned, that the, uh, the certain areas where we desperately need teachers, we need ESL teachers, we need science teachers, we need math teachers, there is a shortage. And maybe what we do is we look at actually boosting pay for those specific areas to attract more people. But in no way are we at the bottom of the barrel. This is just, this is just, just patently false to claim that Virginia state salaries are at the very low end in the bottom four or five of, uh, of the country. Appreciate the second shot. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. DeMay. And, and I'll say that we certainly have been um, more attuned to the topic of teacher pay over the last several years. And we asked our HR department as a, um, an exercise annually uh, as part of our budget deliberations to create a real chart, a real step chart that shows us where we are in comparison with our regional peers, including Henrico, including Hanover. And uh, you know, just, just last year's chart showed us leading on 30 out of 36 steps alone. So this is contrary, however, to um, some of the um, beliefs or rhetoric that may be out there sometimes as it relates to going to other jurisdictions and making thousands of dollars more. And so, it, um, it, but it is something we, we definitely pay attention to and Mary Martin Selby keeps us apprised of any changes to that chart uh, throughout the year. And we're grateful for that effort because it helps keep us focused on the task at hand. And, and the task is, is that we do have a shortage and we do need to pay people so that they can um, appropriately pay uh, for the things that you know, sure. provide for their families and so on. So um, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I, I do feel like that is a, an area where we made progress last year and, that it, and, and also an area where we'll make progress again uh, this year. Um, but again, uh, be, be competitive in the region. Absolutely. Thanks, sir. Thank you. All right. Well, um, seeing nothing else online, okay. And we have two more. Come on up. Yeah, you can go first. Come on up. Sure. Sure. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Dr. Casey, Mr. Winslow, it's nice to see you both again. Um, thank you guys for being here this evening to go through this process with us. Uh, my name is Lindy Walker. I have three kids that, well, one that graduated from Chesterfield County Public Schools last year and two who are still in the school system here. I'm going to add on a little bit to my husband's last comment. I don't think that he was at all advocating for having children in trailers, but rather for improving the school facilities such that their parents would prefer that they be inside the building. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the teachers that my kids have been very privileged to have in the school system here. When my family was making a decision to relocate to Virginia, 15 years ago now. Um, the only child we had at the time was two. The school system was a big deal to us. It was what drew us to Chesterfield County to come look in the first place, looking at the scores for the local schools and frankly seeing how much better they were than the education our daughter was gonna get if we stayed in Texas where we were. <laughs> so. Um, what part of Texas? Uh, we grew up in Fort Worth. Um, but, uh, and not to say that we didn't get good educations there, but the quality of education that my children have had here versus what we had growing up is just astonishingly different. Um, and I think that's due in large part to the faculty that you guys have in the buildings here. I, my kids have had more truly astounding and wonderful teachers. Like I'd start throwing off names like Justin did earlier with the um, COO, but I'm kind of afraid that I'm going to forget someone because there have been so many across three kids. Um, but the buildings are overcrowded, and the teachers are working very, very hard to cover for other teachers that are not there. We are seeing people leaving not only our school system, but leaving the profession after the stresses of the last two years. I just got an email from one of my son's teachers a couple weeks ago that he's decided to go work in the private sector, and I don't really know how they're going to cover that class because I haven't asked anyone. But it's a real problem 
that our schools are facing. So giving them the tools to be able to recruit, whether salary surveys say, I mean, yes, you can manipulate data six ways from Sunday and make it say what you want to say. We have to be competitive with the other counties around here in order to continue to attract the kind of talent that are going to make people who live across the country look at our schools and say, this is where we want to raise our kids. Let's move there, which in turn is going to bring the kind of businesses that you guys want to have here because they want to know that they're going to have an employee base to draw from if they're going to build here. So I am also in favor of fully adopting the school budget as proposed and funding what they're asking for. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I, I do think is important to note is that we don't have uh, final numbers yet from the state. The you know they're going back into session here for I guess another two more weeks for a bonus session. I, I'm glad I'm not going down there, uh, but they are um, you know they are trying to work out I think a three billion dollar gap I read. So we don't have final state numbers, and uh, I know that our chair and vice chair uh, from the boards, uh, the board of, board of uh, supervisors, and the school board are going to be meeting soon and, and discussing some of these items um, further um, and I agree with everything you just said so um, uh, the great resignation as it were is real and I think uh, the last couple of years have been hard on every single person everybody's carrying a some kind of a load whether it's um, something that's happened in the family or friends or or what have you um, the pandemic has has created a situation for for everybody and I, I am proud of our division in setting aside monies for loss of learning I think they've done a good job with that um, and that I know that effort will extend into next year and I'm, I'm grateful for that um, because it's it's been a tough time for learning and we do have to keep an eye on academics so um, your point about businesses being attracted to Chesterfield is uh, taken and is absolutely correct. In fact, um, you know, Intel, who's building a 400, I'm not sure we wanted that size anyway, but a 400 acre building um, uh, chip plant in Columbus, Ohio, specifically cited uh, the strength of schools and the strength of our population as it relates to education and academics here. So they uh, see us as an asset to them and I'm sure others will and others do as we, um, as, as we move along, but particularly these high tech jobs that are well paying and can really you know, change people's lives if you have a 20 year career at a, at, with some of these jobs. Um, uh, it's something we want to attract. We think it'll make our county better. And so your your point's well taken. Thank you. Mr. Winslow, and I think you can extrapolate on it, but when you reference the state and, and schools, you know, one of the things we did this fall was better understand what the state's constraints are to a school system. So when, when a governor or, or the state announces a raise for teachers, it's only recognizing the teachers in a state formula, not the Chesterfield teachers. And I think there's over 800 plus teachers that we employ today that are not recognized by the state because they're above whatever the minimum standards of the state are. And we don't want to teach to a minimum standard. So uh, we have to come up locally with the funds sometimes to match what the state is doing. And even when the state says there is a certain raise, it's a raise based upon what they deem uh, a teacher salary should be and the benefits of a teacher salary, not what we do. So there's an inherent challenge in just keeping up with the state machine that doesn't recognize all of us. But I know Mr. Winslow and the entire board was part of a state delegation meeting last fall, and that was uh, topic number one. We, we continue, and I think both boards have really come together around the topic of unfunded mandates. And when you fund uh, just this many positions for raises and not the folks over here, I felt, uh, you know, it's, it's, you look at it and you go, what kind of sense does this make? And it's the same thing with uh, our constitutional officers, uh, sheriff, you know, commonwealth attorney, and we hear from them every budget cycle um, that they have needs that aren't being met by their funding formulas um, at the state. And so really both boards um, have come together in a united front to combat what I think can only be labeled an unfunded mandate at this point and, and um, you know, ask them to not you know, institute any more unfunded mandates when they go down there uh, for session. So, um, 
this is something that I think is a, it's a long game, uh, if you will, with, with our state. But I, I am hopeful, and based on some of the comments I'm hearing, it um, sounds like some of the um, positions may be expanded in terms of what they're going to fund in the way of um, increases. So we'll, we'll see, I guess, when we get the final product out of the conference committee down there. But um, again, uh, points well taken. To, thank you, Joe. Um, thank, thank you, gentlemen. I think there may have been one more question, but I don't want to shortchange anybody. Did you have one? Ma'am, you good? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't have anyone else online again. So what I want to do is just put this uh, road ahead slide back up if you have it. I don't know if you, uh, if you still have that road ahead. Th these are the other community meetings uh, yet to come, March 16th in Bermuda. Of course, it's all right here, March 21st, March 22nd. And so you can tune in at home if you, you want to do it on your couch, you can do that. And then March 23rd, uh, we have our public hearings and then slated for April 6th budget adoption. And I guess we'll find out over the next two weeks what happens downtown. Uh, hopefully we have a good result down there that um, that they can share with us. Um, and then we're going to continue, like I said, to work with our counterparts on the school board um, and iron the rest of this out. Um, I appreciate everyone being here. And if you would like to um, uh, you know, stop me afterwards and chat a little bit, we can do that. I'll be here uh, to answer every, any question I can. And good to see everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.